The Magic Presence by Godfrey Ray King Tribute The hour is at hand when the humanity of this earth must give more recognition to the activity of the great ascendant masters and angelic host who are constantly pouring out their transcendent light and assistance to mankind. There must come more conscious cooperation between the outer physical life of humanity and these great beings who are the protectors and teachers of the race. There is a special group of these great ones working at the present time with America to stabilize and protect her. Among them, the Ascended Masters, Saint Germain, Jesus, Nada, Sha'ara, Lanto, Cyclopea, the Great Master from Venus, Arcturus, the Lords of the Flame from Venus, and one known as the Great Divine Director, are working here very definitely by establishing tremendous pillars and rays of light in America. They are also focusing these great outpourings of light at certain other points on the earth. They pour out their rays of light through the consciousness of all individuals who will accept them, harmonize their feelings, and turn their attention unto the mighty I Am Presence. If the people will acknowledge this great host of perfected beings and call down their ascended master consciousness into the hearts and minds of mankind, they can give assistance and protection without limit to those who make the call and through them reach the rest of humanity. Only the ascended master consciousness, which is the mighty I am presence, can ever reestablish order and security upon this earth. Only this consuming flame of divine love can ever dissolve the fear in the feelings of the people. Only as the individual turns his attention to these great ascended masters and asks their blessing upon the rest of mankind is the connection made and the door opened by which their help can come through, releasing its perfection unto humanity and the earth itself. The ascended master always points each one to two things. First, the individual must look unto his own divinity, the mighty I am presence for all good, keeping his attention upon it and giving it his first and greatest love. Second, he must harmonize his feeling by pouring out divine love as a force to bless everywhere. To the person who will do this, these great beings will give assistance without limit, for they work only and always through the divine self of the individual. The beloved ascended master, Saint Germain, is the emissary from the great white brotherhood who of his own volition and great love is doing certain protective work and bringing certain illumination into America at the present time. He speaks of her often as the jewel of my heart, for whom I have labored for centuries. Jesus has offered to give a special service in connection with St. Germain, and has said, These rays of light which we pour out are very real, tangible currents of energy containing within them all good things and blessing you according to your acceptance. As in the days of old, and in all golden ages, these great perfected beings who have attained the victory through human embodiment will walk and talk face to face with mankind upon earth. They will explain the original divine way of life once again, that human concepts may be cleared and eternal truth be revealed. This book carries the definite radiation of the ascended masters who are working for America at this time, and is charged with St. Germain's ascended master consciousness of freedom and victory in the light. Human fears and limitations shall be cut away, the earth shall be set in divine order once again, and filled full to overflowing with the light of God that never fails. Godfrey Ray King Forward 
This book contains the second group of experiences which I was privileged to have through the love and assistance of the beloved Ascended Master St. Germain. In the first book, Unveiled Mysteries, he revealed many, many things which have been held in secret and sacredly guarded for many centuries. In The Magic Presence, my experiences were the result of applying the knowledge he had previously revealed. In the various retreats of the Great White Brotherhood which we visited, I was shown the tremendous work they do for mankind through their messengers who are sent into the outer world. The good they constantly pour out to this earth and its humanity is beyond any power of words to describe. All they accomplish is done through divine love, for they never use a destructive force at any time and never intrude upon the free will of the individual. Those who are their representatives give everything as a glad, free service of love and know no such thing as failure. The purpose of this book is to reveal to the individual the whereabouts of his own divine self, the mighty I Am Presence, that all who desire may return to their source, receive their eternal inheritance, and feel once again their divine self-respect. If the student or reader of this book will feel himself going through these same experiences, asking the ascended masters to illumine his consciousness by the light of the cosmic Christ, he will receive that outpouring of love which is the open door to all good things and sets mankind free. America is blessed beyond any other part of the earth, and because of her great blessing she must pour out great light. She is the cup through which the great white brotherhood can ever expand the great divine love of the universe and set mankind free. For that reason, their work in America is of very great importance. And if it be necessary for her protection, then that light as of a thousand suns shall descend and consume all selfishness from the earth. The truth, explanation of law, and my experiences given in this book are real, true, and eternal. The retreats, people, and instruments I saw and associated with while with the Ascended Masters are real physical places and things and tangible living, breathing beings. They are not imaginary nor symbolic and are not to be interpreted in any such way. The truth of everything in this book is for the reader to accept or reject as he chooses. If he does not accept or agree with it, that does not remove the truth nor its activity from the universe. But if he can accept the truth herein contained, he can only be blessed thereby, and his world will be a greater and more wonderful place to live in. The great ascended master Saint Germain has told us that the books of the Saint Germain series in the ascended master's octave of light are bound in covers of jewels. May we also value and obey the words of the Ascended Masters contained herein, and become their great love, victory, perfection, illumination, and freedom to all life forever. If the student or reader can feel the great rays of light and love poured out by these Ascended Masters, and can live constantly in adoration to his own mighty I Am Presence, he will positively become the full manifestation of perfection and will have his eternal freedom from the limitations of earth. May the great love, light, and happiness of the Ascended Masters flood the being and world of everyone who reads this book. May it forever be a blazing golden sun illumining the way to peace, prosperity, and freedom until everyone becomes a great heart of ever-expanding perfection, and experiences the full victory of his ascension in the eternal service of the light of God that never fails. Godfrey Ray King The Magic Presence by Shanera I am the presence 
the Eternal One. I am the God Source, the Great Central Sun. I am the love breath, the heartbeat of light. I am the power in wisdom and might. I am the seer, the all-seeing eye. I am the sunlight, the earth and the sky. I am the mountain, the ocean, the stream. I am the quiver in morning's bright gleam. I am the blessing in angels and love. I am the life flowing in, round above. I am the glory all had once in me. I am the light rays that set mankind free. I am the one heart that hears every call. I am the legion of light answering all. I am the scepter of light's loving power. I am the master each moment, each hour. I am the spheres, every song that they sing. I am the heart of creation, its swing. I am all forms, never two quite the same. I am the essence, the will, and the flame. I am myself, all beings, and you. I am the magic presence, the God Self come through. The Magic Presence by Godfrey Ray King Chapter 1 A Strange Occurrence I left you, my reader, at the end of Unveiled Mysteries with the great ascended master, Lonto, sending forth his blessing to America and mankind from the retreat in the Royal Teton. In this book I shall describe another group of important and wonderful experiences which I was privileged to have during those months of association with our beloved Ascended Master St. Germain. I received a message from him one morning enclosing a letter of introduction to a Mr. Daniel Rayborn at the Brown Palace Hotel in Denver. The next day, as I entered the hotel to inquire for him, I met an old friend, Mr. Gaylord, whom I had known for years. He was accompanied by an elderly gentleman whom he presented at once and who, to my surprise, proved to be Mr. Rayborn. I gave him the letter of introduction, and after a few moments' chat, we agreed to have dinner together that evening. The next day found us all en route to the Diamond K Ranch in Wyoming, one of the Rayborn mining properties where the experiences described in this book began. Little did I realize that day what my association with him would mean and to what it would lead later. Such experiences make one realize how perfect the great, wise, all-pervading intelligence is that directs us unerringly to persons, places, and conditions when and where they are most needed. My impression of Rayborn was very pleasant for his whole attitude was one of harmony and kindliness, and at the same time I felt that he was a man of strong character with a keen sense of honor. He had a finely shaped head, classic features, iron-gray hair, and clear, piercing, blue-gray eyes. He stood very erect and was fully six feet two inches in height. He had a son, 18, and a daughter sixteen years old who had just returned from school in the East. 
We reached our destination where the children met us at the train. After chatting a moment, we entered the Rayborn car and were driven to the ranch, a distance of about twenty miles. The son, Rex, was a tall, splendid, good-looking young chap with the same classic features as his father, whom he resembled strongly. He was at least six feet one inch in height, with abundant light brown waving hair and piercing violet blue eyes. The daughter, Nada, was strikingly beautiful, with a strange sort of old-world dignity and grace. She was about five feet seven, slight of build, with hair like her brother's and deep blue eyes. There was a certain charm about all three Rayborns that everyone felt immediately. The wonderful location and beauty of the house and grounds enchanted us, for it lay at the entrance to a narrow valley, extending westward into the embrace of the great Rockies. To the north, a towering peak rose to a height of over 8,000 feet. The house, facing south, was built of blue-gray granite, making one think of the turreted castles of medieval times in Europe and the ancient buildings of the Far East. The grounds immediately surrounding it were beautifully laid out and perfectly cared for. The building itself was large and rectangular in shape, with a tower on each corner, the one at the southwest facing the mountains, forming a large circular room on the third floor. The rest of the structure was only two stories high, and had evidently been built for many, many years. Daniel Rayborn, at the time he was twenty, had inherited the entire estate from an uncle who traveled extensively, was deeply interested in higher research work, and had lived for many years in India and Arabia. We entered the house, Rex showing me to a suite of rooms on the second floor at the southeast corner of the building. Dinner was soon announced, and we enjoyed a delicious meal and the beautifully appointed table. While dining, we entered into the discussion of our plans. During the course of our meal, Mr. Rayborn spoke of expecting John Gray, the superintendent from his mines, to join us that evening. We had scarcely mentioned his name when he was announced. He stepped into the room, greeted the family pleasantly, and I was presented to him. As we shook hands, a cold chill passed over my body, accompanied by a feeling of repulsion. He was a fine-looking man of about forty, almost six feet tall, with piercing dark eyes which I noticed were never still. I saw his eyes follow the daughter very often with a peculiar look, as the others did not seem to notice. Mr. Rayborn excused himself and with the superintendent went into the library. The rest of us went into the music room and enjoyed two hours of delightful music for both children had remarkable voices. It was during the discussion of their musical training that a shade of sadness passed over Nada's face. She remarked, We both inherited our voices from Mother, who sang a great deal in opera where Father first met her. My mother, in speaking of it, often said, We recognized in each other an inner something that grew stronger and stronger as time went on. Later we learned we were twin rays, which of course accounts for the many wonderful things that have happened to us since. We both have said many times that it seemed as if each had been searching for the other through the centuries, and of course there has always been that very great love and perfect understanding between us. Mother's father was an Englishman, and her mother, who was educated in England, was the daughter of an Arab sheikh. Two years ago, Mother was taken ill and passed on within a few weeks, although everything possible was done to save her life. During the last four weeks, she received transcendent revelations that have explained many things to us. Shortly after I was born, our beloved Master St. Germain came to her. He explained that she had work to do on the higher planes of life, and that he would always hold Rex and me in his great loving, protecting care. He is so wonderful and loving to us that I wish we might share that joy with the whole world. 
the East and Far East, that is India, China, Arabia, Egypt, and Persia, give much greater recognition to and understand much more clearly what these great ascended masters have done for humanity and how much the entire race of our earth owes to their transcendent love and far-reaching care. He has taught us so plainly the way by which these great ones have been able to raise and illumine the physical body by purifying it through the use of the consuming flame of their own divinity, which he calls the mighty I Am Presence. He tells us this can only be accomplished by adoration of that presence and complete obedience of the personality or outer consciousness to its every direction. He says the secret is to keep in constant inner communion with the I Am Presence at all times so that the perfection which it is ever pouring forth can come through the outer consciousness without being distorted by our own inharmony and that of the physical world around us. It is in this way St. Germain explained that the ascended masters have reached complete dominion over all manifestation and have finished the work in human embodiment which Jesus said every one must sometime do. They express forever full mastery over all conditions on this physical earth for all substance and energy are their willing and obedient servants even to the elements and powers of nature because they have become the fullness of divine love. Their entire work with mankind is to lead everyone eventually to this same mastery but it can only come through the self-effort of the individual and the fullness of enough love. Mother had many strange experiences in her childhood, and my grandmother told her of others, still stranger, for her grandfather had seen many of the remarkable things which these great ones do. One whom he knew quite well was from my grandmother's own land of Arabia. He was greatly adored by all he contacted, as his entire life was a constant blessing and service to mankind. St. Germain first came to Mother one night at the beginning of her career in Grand Opera. She had been singing only a few months when one evening she became almost speechless with stage fright. She was in her dressing room shortly before the performance when a frantic fear seized her making her forget everything. St. Germain stepped through in his tangible body, introduced himself, and touched her forehead with the fingers of his right hand. Instantly, all nervousness left. The memory of her part returned, and she was calm and at ease. That night, her success was tremendous, and it continued to increase, becoming brilliant beyond her fondest dreams. He told her she had earned the right to the protecting presence of the Ascended Masters, and from that time on it would be permanent. He described the man she was to marry, also the son and daughter who were to come to her. After this he came at regular intervals and taught her many inner laws which she was able to comprehend and apply with astonishing results astonishing at least to those who are unable to use the higher law, but perfectly natural always to those who understand and manipulate those laws through love. Father, St. Germain said, was not sufficiently awakened to be told of such activities until about a year ago when, because of danger that threatened, St. Germain came to him in the tangible body and explained that Father would come very near death at the hands of one whom he trusted as a friend, but to remain at peace, for the Ascended Masters would give the needed protection. We were all so engrossed in this conversation that I felt almost disappointed when Mr. Rayborn and the superintendent joined us. After listening to Nada and Rex sing an Arabian love song for their father, we all parted for the night and went, to our rooms. I was so thrilled, because St. Germain had come to Mrs. Rayborn, that I had no desire for sleep. I began to feel 
There was a greater reason for my being in their home than I was outwardly aware. I sat down in a comfortable chair and gave myself up to the contemplation of the ascendant masters with deep gratitude to them for the gracious welcome with which these blessed people had received me. I must have dropped off to sleep, for I awakened with a start and thought I had heard someone calling me. I felt such an urge to get up and go out into the open air that I could not resist it. I was thoroughly awake, keenly expectant of something, but what I knew not. I went downstairs, out of the house, and down a path near a large barn. In a moment there was a movement among the shadows, and following a sudden impulse I stepped behind a tree. At the same instant a man came out of the barn. I saw another movement among the trees, and looking closer discerned a man standing with a rifle to his shoulder, dimly visible in the darkness. As he took aim at the man coming out of the barn, I wanted to call out a warning, but I could not make a sound. Before I could think, a blinding flash of light struck the man with a rifle full in the face, revealing his features as he fell face forward, as if struck by lightning, yet the sky was crystal clear. Still I was unable to move from my position, and the man from the barn came steadily on, totally unaware of his escape. I saw it was Mr. Rayborn, though he did not see me. So I remained where I was until he had passed into the house, and I hurried to the spot where I had seen the man fall, but he had fled. I searched around for some distance, but found no trace of him. So I returned to my rooms. It was then almost one o'clock. I got into bed quickly, and by a strong effort was able to go to sleep. When I went down to breakfast the next morning, all were radiantly happy except Gray, the superintendent, who seemed nervous and extremely pale. The Rayborns, Gaylord and I, had a most enjoyable time planning our day, which ended with the children suggesting that we go to Table Mountain, one of their favorite haunts in the Wyoming Rockies. Meanwhile, Gray was almost sullenly silent, refusing to meet the eyes of anyone. He finished breakfast, excused himself, and drove to the station. When he was gone, my first impulse was to tell Rayborn of the previous night's experience, but upon a second thought, decided to wait until I could see him alone. I excused myself, prepared for our trip up the mountain, and returned just in time to see the groom bringing out our horses. One of them was a beautiful Arabian steed, cream in color, with white mane and tail, the most wonderful animal I have ever seen. He came directly up to Nada, to whom he belonged, and with a look in his eyes that was almost of human intelligence, stood proudly before her, waiting for the lumps of sugar she held out. She loved him, and he knew it. This is Pegasus, she said, patting him. He reached out, put his nose against my face, went over to Rex and then back to Nada, as if giving consent to my being a member of the party. He approves of you and accepts you as a trusted friend, Nada commented, after watching his expression a moment. That is a new behavior for him, as he has never made friends with anyone but Rex, the groom, and myself. Where did you get him? I asked. He was given to mother, she replied, by an Arab sheikh in appreciation for a concert she gave in Cairo. He was sent here to the ranch as a surprise when she returned from her last tour. It was really the last concert of her career, and her success was tremendous. The old sheikh loved music and enjoyed that concert especially. Pegasus is handsome, isn't he? She continued. The love in Nada's voice was unmistakable, 
and justifiable, for no one could help but admire the beautiful creature. We mounted our horses, waved goodbye to Rayborn, cantered off across the valley, and soon entered the mountain trail. It wound steadily upward through the beautiful timber. Occasionally, we came into a clearing and stopped to enjoy the magnificent view. We followed the mountain stream for quite a distance. The song of the birds, the fragrance of the flowers, and the exhilaration of the rarefied air made us feel radiantly strong and glad to be alive. We reached the top of the mountain near noon, and there before us lay a level space covering at least twenty acres. A veritable plateau suspended in the midst of those towering giants. A cozy little cabin and a shelter for the horses had been built. It was made of stone, with a built-in stove very unique and serviceable. We enjoyed the beauty of the surrounding country for a while, and then sat down to a delightful lunch. You know, Rex commented, I feel as if we had all known each other for ages, and Nada and I admitted we felt the same. Let's go to the cave by the other trail as soon as we finish lunch, he suggested, and we agreed. By crossing over to the opposite side of the mountain, we found a good trail leading down, where the scenery was more wild and rugged. In some places, the rocks looked as if they had been stained green, blue, and black by some marvelous mineral coloring. The sunlight and shadow played upon them as we changed our position, producing the effect of a beautiful, inspiring panorama. We continued down the trail about 4,000 feet, turned sharply, and came to the eastern face of the mountain. Thousands of years ago, a portion of it had evidently split away, making the whole side a sheer cliff at least a thousand feet above us. The trail we were on wound around the south side, turning toward the eastern wall and running along a shelf-like projection that brought us to the entrance of the cave. The trail was strewn with great boulders that made it rough and difficult of access. A wing of rock hid the entrance, as if nature jealously guarded its secret from curious eyes. We left the horses tied safely nearby, and Rex took three powerful flashlights from his saddlebag. Prepare for a surprise, he exclaimed, turning to me, and then led the way into the cave. About fifty feet from the opening we entered a medium-sized cavern. As soon as my eyes became adjusted to the change of light, I saw the entire ceiling was covered with a pink and white crystalline substance. We crossed the first space, a distance of about thirty feet, and passed through an archway leading into an immense vaulted chamber at least two hundred feet across. The ceiling was covered with rainbow-colored stalactites in the most amazing forms I have ever seen. There were crosses, circles, crosses within circles, triangles, and many, many occult symbols that have been in use on this earth since its very beginning. It looked as if these symbols had been suspended from the ceilings ages ago, and nature had covered them with a carbonate of lime formation, highly colored and most artistically decorated by her pigments. The beauty of it made one speechless. Fascinated with wonder and admiration, it gave one the feeling of eyes watching every moment. Rex called to us to come to the far side of the chamber where he stood. We crossed the intervening space and stood before a wall, upon which there were three arches, about twenty feet apart. Within each was a highly polished surface. The first one to my left was a Chinese red, the second a glittering white, and the third a cobalt blue. Immediately I felt they were significant of something concerning America. The feeling grew so great I could hardly stand it. This is the work of a mighty intelligence in ages past, I said, 
and I feel that these arches close entrances to other chambers or passages beyond. Nada and Rex looked at me very steadily, and their faces were white, of the intensity of something they saw. What is the matter? I asked. Don't you feel it? Don't you see it? they asked in return. What? I replied. They then realized that I was unaware of what they saw, and explained, You are evidently being overshadowed, said Nada, by an etheric form you wore ages ago, for the garments are unlike anything of which I have ever seen or heard. The body is at least six feet eight inches tall. The hair is golden, coming almost to your shoulders, and the skin is fair and clear. I am sure some ancient memory is trying to come forth into the outer consciousness. Let's tell him of our experience the last time we were here, she suggested to Rex. Just a year ago, Rex explained, we came to this cave, and as I stood before the blue arch, I was so fascinated that I put out my hand and was running it over the surface when a voice right out of the atmosphere said, Stop! The voice was not one of anger but rather that of supreme authority. We left the cave immediately and have never returned until now. Before I have ended my visit with you, dear people, I feel certain some amazing explanation of it all will be given, I replied. We returned to our horses and found the beautiful Arabian Pegasus in a state of great agitation for he was highly sensitive to the spiritual power focused within this mountain, and it made him restless because of the intensity of the energy. Only by very great gentleness could not acquire him and prevent him from racing madly home. She said there seemed to be no limit to his speed when he became excited. We continued on our way homeward, winding around the foot of the mountain until we came to the end of our descent. Then we gave the horses free rein, and in half an hour reached the ranch just before sunset. Daniel Rayborn came out to meet us, and said dinner would soon be ready. During the meal we related the experiences of the day, Rex telling his father of the overshadowing forms seen above my head in the cave. As he finished speaking, without giving any explanation, his father said he wanted to talk to all three of us in the library after dinner and to meet him there at eight o'clock. In the meantime, we went to the music room while Nada went to her mother's room and brought back an Arabian instrument, something like an Hawaiian guitar. It was given to her by Saint Germain who taught her to play certain melodies upon it just before her meditation hour. Nada and Rex both sang and took turns playing the accompaniments on the instrument formed a most wonderful background for their voices, for there was something in the quality of the tone that seemed like a living thing, and that penetrated to the very...